Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is a game from the 1958-59 U.S. Championship between Bobby Fischer playing as White and Samuel Ryshevsky. There are a few things highlighted in this game. For one, or the main one, there's a very sharp tactic really early on in the game. This game lasts 42 moves, but it's over long before that. And once one side has an advantage, a material plus in this case, we see that common strategy of making even exchanges and simplifying the position and also being mindful that we can invest some uh, material back in order to keep our opponent uh, off balance and uh, uncoordinated. So let's see what took place in this game. Again, Fisher on the white end. He opened with e4. Ryshevsky replied with the Sicilian defense. Knight f3, knight c6. We have an open Sicilian. Black prepares a kingside fianchetto. And now anticipating this natural pressure on d4, it's bishop e3. Some more natural moves coming in, getting the minor pieces developed and getting castled. Bishop to b3 is the first maybe not so natural looking move. But its aim is to sidestep a common tactical motif that black has available. For example, if white castles here instead of bishop b3, this is the combination I'm referring to, taking on e4 and following up with d5. The short story here is that black will regain that material and have benefited as a result of that combination since they've eliminated white's only central pawn. One other detail I'd like to emphasize here is the timing of this combination of moves, taking on e4 and then playing d5. You'll notice this here, after bishop c4, this is the first instance where it may seem that black could go in for this capture, but it's not on for as long as the black king remains on his home square. If black goes in for it right away, you'll notice after d5, there's bishop b5, and there's going to be a problem on c6. Pawn takes knight, there's knight takes knight. If you're immediately recapturing, black's going to end up in a fork. One other detail, I'd like to actually take this just one step further. After queen takes queen, for the moment, let me just make this inferior king takes queen move. This right here is a common configuration that we could see arising out of many openings. It's important to know how you can get the piece back in this case. Again, taking like this, you end up in a fork. The trick here to get the piece back would be first a6, kicking a bishop to this a4 square, and then interposing on d7 with the bishop, and maybe even in some cases you could do so with the queen, taking advantage of, again, this unprotected piece on a4. This is, of course, not the same case here. Taking with the king is not best. Taking with the rook is, because now after this a6 idea to get the piece back, well, that's just falling for me in one. So my main point here was to not only emphasize the motif itself, but the timing of it. Okay, black castle, bishop b3, and in the game we saw a serious blunder already by move 8. Black's move knight to a5 is not good. Uh, can you spot why that is the case? If you'd like to, go ahead, pause the video, see what move or sequence of moves you would play in this position. Okay, the move here was e5. And before I go any further, let me just emphasize that d6 would have been better to open up the diagonal for the bishop and stop e5. But black was trying to go quickly for the bishop pair, trying to take out that guy. But e5 is now going to pose black some serious problems. Where is he going to go? To the edge? g4. He's dead. What about here? Well, we'll soon see what happens if he goes there. Let me just first point out that this would have been the best continuation for black to go in for the rook, give up the two minor pieces. White stands better still. But in the game after e5, it was knight to e8. And now this is where that sharp combination 
comes into play here. If you'd like to, once again, go ahead, pause the video, see if you can find White's next stunning move. All right, the move here is bishop takes f7. What a shot. <laughs> Regardless of how this bishop is captured, uh, white's going to follow up the same. In the game, it was king takes bishop, and in comes knight to e6, taking advantage of the fact that this queen is unprotected, and all these squares are now covered with the minor pieces. If you didn't spot this bishop to f7 move, uh, one of the things that could have maybe helped you to see this combination of taking on f7 and then following up with knight to e6 is to realize what black's last move was doing. It is interfering with the coordination of the queen and rook. As soon as he arrives on e8, the queen on d8 is unprotected. This is often uh, signaling possibilities for tactics when you have an unprotected piece. So bishop takes pawn was played, king takes bishop, and now knight to e6. If you take like this, the move played in the game, well, we're going to get the queen. Why wasn't king takes knight played? Well, it's going to run into a mate in six with check, check, another check. If you go here, that's mate. And if you go to one of these three, white plays the same move, queen to g2. And now there's three different mates. Can't stop all three. So in the game, what was played is pawn takes knight, and now the queen is lost, and we enter this already lost position after 12 moves. White has a queen, and black only has two minor pieces to show for it. So the plan from here is basically to just exchange pieces, even exchanges. You'd really like to, as white, exchange off a pair of rooks, um, Black will find it much more difficult to stay coordinated. That is a very important thing to do when you're without the queen. If there's some type of imbalance in the in the game, uh, without two rooks on the board, this is going to be very difficult for black to remain in a harmonious position. So white is seeking exchanges, hitting at e6. c3 is just a nice restricting move, keeping the knight out of these squares. The d4 square uh, is the main one here, especially now with this pawn on e5. So it's just boxing out that knight. This pawn on c3 is boxing out the knight. White gets a rook involved. We have the bishops coming off soon enough. After knight to e4, queen takes pawn. The knight jumps into d6. He's intolerable. There goes the dark square bishop. And now we have b4, looking to disrupt the coordination of black's pieces. The knight is kicked. The rook backs up. He eventually wants to get to the c7 square. This is covered. This is his destination, trying to get to c, uh, the uh, seventh rank. Knight f7, rook to c5, trying to get some play here for the rook, but that's just going to be closed right down. With b6, this gives up the c6 square, but... Um, White has a good follow-up here. Bishop c6 looks to just string everything together, but you have to recognize that this is just too strong for white to uh, deal with. It's very strong coordination of pieces, and this is what I was referring to in the beginning of the game with investing some material back. That bishop cannot be uh, tolerated. Just get rid of him, and on top of that, you have a passed pawn. So there's... Even even if, for some reason, this pawn wasn't around, this is something to still certainly look into, giving that rook up for the bishop and disrupting uh, the black pawns, making coordination, making life much more difficult for the black side. In this, in this case, it's all the more appealing because of this pass pawn, but just recognize, yes, you can invest some material back. We got b7 in, black is on the defensive, white scoops up a pawn, this pawn will be one back, but don't forget about this A pawn because it's the one who will uh, have the final say in this game. After rook takes, rook takes, queen A8. It's at this point that black already throws in the towel. The game's over. There's nothing to do. There's no good way to coordinate the rook and the knight here that would stop the A pawn. White has a flight square. You could throw this check in, king H2. 
this pawn will run and there's no way that you could stop him. Right, you could maybe somehow get a, if you could just, let's throw some moves in here, suppose, I don't know, knight here, the pawn advances, the rook gets behind, maybe the knight tries to get here, but you'll notice, I mean, this isn't a stable square. This pawn on c4 can always offset the one on c6, the knight has no uh, good safe square, there's no good way to coordinate to stop this pass pawn, and it is, it is again at this point, after queen to a8 that Ryshevsky simply resigned. So uh, that's all for this video. As always, I hope you got something out of it. Take care.